If you could turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, chapter 4 and verse 8. If you're a member of the church or with us any length of time, you know we're, we're going through a series called Gospel Community. We had a marvelous time studying the book of Ruth about the, the love of God revealed in that story, and then we've chosen to take a number of weeks to talk about what, what does it mean to be a church community, to love one another, to care for one another. And after this series, we're going to go into a lengthy study of the book of Ephesians, which we're going to title Together in Christ, all about the magnificent effect that the coming of the Lord Jesus had in reconciling, really, the universe to God in the finished work of Christ bringing the cosmos into the right order and the people involved in that are those that God has saved, God has brought together to himself and to each other in the church. And so that's present in the book of Ephesians. We wanted to start with studying a number of different passages that speak to this issue of community life. What does it mean to love one another as a community? So let me read this passage this morning, just two verses. We're going to focus primarily on the second verse, but two verses beginning in verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 4. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. When I was a boy, I have a, a distinctive memory of a time when we were, we had just joined a church that we'd eventually stay in for a lengthy period of time. And we were invited over to someone's house, me and, and, and I think my brother was there as well, and there was going to be a number of families there, and, and a lot of the guys were out front playing basketball, just kind of young at that age. I was 10, 11, 12, something like that. And something happened during the game where one kid did something to another kid, and there was this conflict, and, and to my surprise, everybody was sort of marched inside into the house, and moms that were there went through their leadership of their kids, their two sons there. And then there was this brokenhearted, I, I thought from my recollection as a kid, brokenhearted repentance from one kid to the other. I'm so sorry and I'm sorry. Now you have to realize, I, I, I thought of myself as a pretty godly kid. Um, I, I grew up thinking I was pretty much better than anybody I knew. Um, I, I have not, I've yet to meet someone that was uh, more impressed with themselves as a young kid than I was. So uh, this is a new church experience. I came into this community and I'm, I'm watching these boys tearfully repenting to one another about how they've sinned. And I, and I was suddenly feeling uh, not anywhere near as godly as I thought I was because I thought, wow, I, I, I can't really imagine doing that. And this is like this really impressive, well, that actually had a profound effect on my life. That moment, I, I wasn't involved, I'm just observing this. Young kid, it had a significant, it's one of those memories from childhood that just stuck with me. It affected me, it humbled me, it motivated me. I wasn't anywhere near as impressive as I thought I was. There's a depth of godliness being displayed here and, and training even that I, I just was unfamiliar with. It, it provoked me. It motivated me. The thought I had was, man, I, I better get on my game here because this, this is a whole new level of godliness I'm dealing with around here. I am no longer top dog in this group. It was good for me. It was humbling. It, it, it humbled my sense of importance. Now, I, I want to point to what could be a hidden lesson in that whole story. It's the lesson of hospitality. The reason all of that happened, there's a lot of reasons. The parents are trying to train their children, and repentance is being displayed, and godliness is being displayed from these young children from one to the other, and you're inviting newcomers like me into that circle. And, but, but, but there's something behind that that made all of that possible, and that was that that family invited 
us over. And because of that context, the church could be the church. A new person was transformed, was affected, was humbled, was motivated. But all of that started with somebody deciding, I'm going to set apart this day and my home to welcome people in. Hospitality was the context for the church to do what the church does. And that's precisely what Peter is speaking about here. It's actually a, a strong encouragement in the Bible and in the New Testament. A strong encouragement is to show hospitality to one another, the welcoming of one another into our homes. We spoke about it a couple weeks ago when we looked at the early church in Acts. What are they doing? They're breaking bread in their homes together. Last week we spoke about how we're called to love and to reflect the love we've received. And here Peter gives a, a significant example of what gospel-motivated love does. How does it work itself out? It's fine to say I love you, but what does that look like in regular life? Well, Peter says it looks like showing hospitality to one another. Our hearts and our homes should be a refuge for the people of God. Our hearts and our homes should be a refuge for the people of God. That's all I would summarize these two verses. The second verse flows out of the first. But let's, let's walk through these two verses and then we'll seek to apply it to our lives. Two marks are evident here. The second one flows out of the first. But two marks, because Peter's concern in this book of 1 Peter, just for a little background, is to help Christians understand the magnificence of what they have received in Christ. If you read from the beginning, he says, you, are, you are, I have an inheritance that has been given to you this incredible gift of the Lord. And not only that, you've been built in as, as living stones. You are now the temple of the Lord on earth. And not only that, Jesus suffered in your place so that now you're set apart to a totally different kind of lifestyle. You stand out in the world from all the world with, with evil and wickedness and selfishness. There, there is this people on earth that are set apart by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and their lives should be marked by that privilege. They should be changed by that privilege. The gospel should transform them. It should be evident in their life. That's what Peter's been preaching for the last few chapters. Then he gets to chapter 4. And he keeps going and says, let me give you, again, what, what should this look like? How do you look different now that God has done all these great things? And he says, above all, and we get the first mark that I'll reference this morning, the loving heart. The loving heart and the loving home. The loving heart and the loving home will be the two points. The loving heart, Peter says, he wants to highlight above all. Paul will say the same thing in 1 Corinthians, a well-known passage, you know. Look, look if, if you might have prophecies, you might have tongues, you might have any number of different things, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. Love is this supreme evidence. There's a reason that the fruit of the Spirit begins with love. There's a reason Jesus said, by this all people will know you are my disciples if you love one another, right? There's this supremacy to love. It encompasses all of the other graces of the Christian life. It motivates them. It fuses them with spiritual passion. The Holy Spirit invades a person that previously was selfish and changes them to be loving. If you had to pick one word of horizontal transformation that takes place when a person becomes a Christian, love would be the right word. They are now loving. And love, as we mentioned last week, is sacrificial service for the sake of someone's good. Above all, he says, keep loving one another earnestly. Earnestly. Now, Peter has already given a multitude of reasons of why it would make sense for you to love. I mean, Jesus died for your sins, and you've been built in as a temple, and these people are those that are also indwelt by the Spirit of God. That they, there, There's all these reasons we could look back at the book and see, why should I love these people? Lots of reasons. But in this verse, Peter actually gives an explicit reason of why we should love one another. He says, since, here's why you should love one another earnestly. Here's why. Love covers a multitude of sins. In this instance, Peter doesn't actually point us backward, although he could have, 
all the motives we have for love, he points us forward to a need that people experience. Namely, for their sins to be covered. Peter assumes two things here. He assumes that Christians will continue to sin in their Christian life. He assumes that. And he assumes that they will need somebody who is willing to cover over, to overlook, to bear with, to not cause them enduring shame and harm, to not cause them isolation, to, to cover over with affection their sins. He's saying, look, Christians need this. Christians need someone who is willing to overlook and cover over and not only some sins, but a multitude, it says. That love has this capacity to, to welcome the porcupine and smother their sinful tendencies with affection. Love covers, it says, a multitude of sins. I don't think this is atoning love. It's not, he's not saying if you love someone else, your sins are forgiven. I, I don't think that would be in keeping with anything he said to this point. I think he's saying it's the sins of others that in a horizontal way, we have this ability to, to cover over, to, to, to cause them to experience a welcome. I think the word refuge, our loving hearts should be a refuge for the sinful Christians that make up the church. Isn't that what he's saying there? A marvelous, marvelous image. And he assumes that a Christian who is also a sinner would understand and be sympathetic to that need. Based on everything he said, he's saying, well, well surely that would motivate someone. Oh, you, you have need for someone to cover over, to be a refuge for you as a sinner who loves you in spite of your sins. You have someone like that. And he just assumes, well, surely Christians would be motivated to do that. And we can understand why he would make that assumption, can't we? Why would Christians be motivated to be a refuge for a sinner? Because that's what God did for them. So there ought to be, Peter assumes a heart, oh, there's a sinner. Why would I not want to be a refuge of love for them? Why, why would I not want to be a, a safe place for them? Of course a Christian would want to do that. That's exactly what God has done for you. My multitude of sins were given refuge in the death of Christ. My, my multitude of failures were given refuge in the atoning blood of Christ. My, my multitude of, of short-falling weaknesses and, and, and condemnable uh, transgressions were given refuge in his love. God's love in the blood of Christ gave me a refuge as a sinner. And so Peter says, Love covers a multitude of sins. Christians need people to reflect towards them the same love that you've received in the gospel. Surely Christians are motivated to do that. Now we need this reminder. We, we, need, we need this reminder because Peter's assumption, I think sometimes has to be re-envisioned. Because we can tend to think of people as annoying, as burdensome and prickly. And we kind of wish that someone else could take care of that issue and that person. And can't I just have people that welcome me and not have to welcome the other prickly people? But Peter says, no, keep loving one another earnestly. Why? Because they have a multitude of sins that someone, someone has to reflect the love of God. Who's going to do it? Doesn't it make sense it would be the church? Of course it does. Who in the world, it's like Peter searches out the world, it's like, oh, we have all these, these sinful Christians. Can we find somebody who will love them? Who, who would do that? Who's going to love a, an impatient person? Oh, that impatient soul, who's going to love them? Who's going to love that person that's always late? 
Who is going to love that person? That person that's always condescending. Who can we find to love that person? Who can we find to love the person who's lazy? What about the person that's self-righteous? What about that person that's constantly telling you what you're doing wrong? Oh, we got to find somebody to love them. Who is going to love them? What about the person who struggles with lust? Oh, that's going to be hard. With somebody who can love them. What about this person who struggles with, with sexual temptation or sin? Oh, we got to find somebody to love them. Who can we find somebody to love that arrogant person? Who can we find? That caustic, sarcastic person. We got to find. But who are we going to find to love these people? I know. Forgiven sinners. Perfect. Love covers a multitude of sins. We are uniquely equipped to understand that need and to be a refuge for the sinners that Peter assumes will be present in the church. And isn't it to our benefit to cultivate a sin-covering type of love in the church? I mean, this is kind of selfishly motivated too, isn't it? I mean, don't we want to do this? Unless we're sort of hedging our bets, well, as long as we, we, we'll just find it so that just the right amount of my type of sin is covered over and not anybody else's. That's the ideal scenario. No, Peter says, no. The loving heart, Peter says, it's a mark of this transforming work that God has done. Secondly, the loving home. The loving home. Peter gives an example. I think this flows out of verse 8. What does it mean, Peter says, to love one another earnestly? Let me give you practical, very as practical as it gets, let me give you a practical example of what it means to love one another earnestly. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, he says. So a loving heart creates a loving home. We might say that God has claimed our home for the loving of his people. God has claimed our home. If you're a Christian, God has claimed, chosen your home for the loving of his people. Your home, your heart, yes, but your home is to be a refuge for the people of God. It's to be a loving refuge. You notice the connection of these verses. See how connected they are? The sinner needs hearts that can cover over their sins. They also need homes that can cover over their bodies. You see this? He just transitions easily. See, there's this spiritual covering that takes place. And then in hospitality, there's a physical outworking of that same principle. Look, if you welcome somebody in your heart, obviously you'd welcome into your home. It's from the greater to the lesser. If you can cover over a multitude of sins, then certainly, certainly you can welcome them into your living room. Show hospitality, he says. What's a mark that makes you look like a Christian in an evil world? Hospitality. It's a, it's a covering over. It's a refuge. It's a place of welcome. It's the gospel on physical display. Hospitality is the gospel on physical display. Welcoming people into your home reflects the welcome we have received in Christ. Your home is a tangible example of God's welcome of sinners into heaven. Your home is to be an outcropping of heaven on earth. Your home is a room expressing God's home from heaven invading earth. Why do you have a home to reveal the love of God? The loving heart and the loving home. Peter says, love one another earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins. Surely this would be a, a desire that you would have to display this towards someone. Doesn't that change our, our way of... Pete, Peter's heart here is just convicting. It's motivating. You, I tend to think of sins and hospitality as burdensome, duty, drudgery. Peter sees them as an opportunity. Peter assumes a kind of eagerness to reveal that we are indeed set apart, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, as he says earlier in the book, set apart to declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. How would you want to do that? I certainly would want to do that. How can you do that? Invite people into your home. 
That'll set you apart. The loving home. Use your home to love the people of God, Peter says. Notice it's hospitality to one another, to one another. Certainly we should show hospitality to others and those that don't know the Lord and, and, and you know, people in our neighborhood, absolutely. But this passage is specifically directed to the brotherhood of the church. Use your home to love one another, to love those that God has loved. And he says you should do this without grumbling. Without grumbling. <laughs> what a wise pastor this man is. Without grumbling, Peter says. I mean, you can almost feel the pastoral experience. You just, he just extends the sentence, you know, <laughs> show hospitality to one another hmm, without grumbling. Why does he say that? Why, why without grumbling? Well, one, one, one reason he says without grumbling is that Christians are not immune to the temptation of annoyance and worldliness and idolatry and the idol of privacy. He assumes all those things. Anytime you see a, a command to not do something in the Bible, part of what's going on there is Peter assumes that will be a temptation. Now, I think this speaks to a, a category in the church, I think, I've experienced this, I'm sure you have as well, that, that many people talk about how much they love easy friendships. Have you ever had that experience? I love those easy friendships. You know, you just, they're just easy. <laughs> you can hang out and you just talk and I love having them over and they come over. It was just, it was easy the whole time. Now, praise God for easy friendships. I almost feel like sometimes God grants those in our life as a, a, a almost like a kind concession to our limitations. You know, people that don't feel like a burden, it doesn't feel, what you gain from them is actually equal or greater than what you give to them. Well, sure, we, we made dinner for them, but I mean, the laughter we received when they were in our house, more than made up for it. Or they had dinner for us too, so it was easy. Or we sit down to fellowship and there's no awkward pauses, or their jokes actually are funny, and they think my jokes are funny. Or, you know, occasionally, you know, they, they say things that make me think about God in a greater way, and I say things make them think about God in a greater way, and... These are, these are easy friendships, right? Now, we've all experienced those at some point. Here's what happens. We assume that's the only kind of friendship we're called to pursue. Peter's assumption is the opposite, I think. He doesn't say, show hospitality to one another full stop. He says, without grumbling. Why? Well, because hospitality is going to give you a lot of occasions for grumbling. <laughs> Just assume that the person walking into your home is a grumble trap and that Peter's warning you, just assume that and assume that's true of you when you walk into theirs. I am going to be a temptation for you to grumble. Let's, let's move past the idolatry of easy friendships. Let's just acknowledge that in our hearts right now. We, we all have a temptation. We've experienced it in the past. We had a season when we had all these marvelous, easy friendships, and then that season passed us by in some way. We moved or our kids got older or somehow. And now it's like nothing compares to that friendship. Well, you know, you're just not like Joe. I would never say that to you, but that's really what I'm thinking. You're almost as funny, but not quite. You're almost as smart, but not quite. You're almost as athletic, but not quite. You almost make me feel as good as he did, but not quite. The heart we should have is there in verse 8. Well, of course you're not him. You're you. The point is not be somebody else. The point is display the gospel towards the you that's in my life right now without grumbling. Let's think of three reasons to apply this passage why I think we grumble. Why do we grumble? Let's, let's just identify them. Let's, let's get it out in the open, identify them, and let's drive the gospel through them. Okay? Why do we grumble? Well, I think a couple of few reasons. We grumble because we forget the honor of showing hospitality. We forget the honor of it. We think of it as a burden, and so we grumble, rather than thinking of it an honor that should cause us to rejoice. 
We grumble because we forget the honor of showing hospitality. Now, now there's an honor um, in displaying the gospel at any time, but, but I want to actually point us to the honor that happens every time a Christian steps into our home. Peter says earlier that those that have been saved live in the Spirit the way God does. The reason that happens is because the Holy Spirit has indwelt them. He says earlier in the book that each Christian is like a living stone being built into the organic temple of God that is the church. What that means is Christians are associated with the presence of God. There is a new temple on earth. It's the people of God. There is no building where God particularly in habits anymore. It's the people. So when a Christian walks into my home, what is walking into my home is a living, breathing temple of the Holy Spirit, a person saved by the blood of Jesus Christ who has an undefiled inheritance in heaven. That's who just walked through my front door. And I think we forget that, and so we grumble. Because what we think walked through our front door was a child-toting, wall-coloring child who makes messes on my floor and throws food and a person who thinks they're funny is actually annoying and that's who I think walked through my front door a person who's never invited me over although I've invited them over 19 times already and I'm counting yes I am counting that's that's who just walked through my front door but the reality is no what walked through my front door is a living breathing temple of the Holy Spirit claimed by the Lord Jesus Christ whom God has chosen to share his own home I think we grumble less if we remember the identity. We grumble because we forget the honor of showing hospitality. It's an honor to us, and it's an honor to us eternally. We need to be warned by this as well. I want to read a, a, a somewhat lengthy passage from Matthew. We won't dive into this at any length this morning, but it, it's helpful to see how important God views hospitality. Listen to this. Jesus speaking, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For, for, for I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king, the king, will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Hospitality is one of the marks that we have been saved that will give evidence of a life transformed. It's one of the marks. 
It's one of the things that displays the love of God has been poured into our heart. It's, it's one of the things that displays that. Which means, why should we not grumble? Because of the honor of it. Jesus so associates himself with his people that what we do to them, he counts as doing to him. So that one way we could see hospitality is the welcoming of the king into our home. Now let me make it very clear. This has nothing to do with fine food and a perfectly swept house, as though that would be a concern on the heart of the Lord over the love and welcome of his people. Obviously, fine food's marvelous. Swept house, wonderful if it's an act of servanthood, definitely. But hospitality is not much, it's not like an art form, okay? If this is not like something that you need to be impressive in the way you display food. That, that's not the goal here. The goal is a heart of welcome. It's come in. I will give you what I have. My home is yours because if the king was here, it would be. We grumble because we forget the honor. There is an honor. Having people into my home that the king claims as his own is an honor. We grumble because we forget the hospitality of God. Second reason. We do, don't we? Forget the hospitality of God. Think about how hospitable God is. Jesus, soon before he is crucified, says, I go to prepare a place for you. I, I go to prepare a place for you. The Father says, they will see my face saying about it this morning. They will, they will see my face. They will, they will come into my very family room. They will be welcomed as children into my home. Th think about that from a human perspective. Th think about the wisdom and majesty and perfection of God. I mean, could there be a greater disparity of host to guest than God to me? No, no, there could be no greater, greater disparity. Why would God want to talk to me? I mean, talk about a disparity of, of conversational partners. God and you at the table of heaven. But this is the hospitable God that we serve. He, he welcomes people into his very room, into his table. That's what Psalm 23 says, doesn't it? It says, you've prepared a table for me. In the presence of my enemies, my cup runs over. The gospel might be phrased as God saying to sinners, come to my table and eat. Come into my rooms and live. Come under my roof and be protected. I will meet all your needs. That's what God has said to you. If you're a Christian, it's what he invites to you. If you're not a Christian, the God of heaven says to you, come, live here, live here forever. My home will have permanent guests called sinners, now saved, now cleansed, now made holy, clothed in righteousness. Come. The next time we're thinking about a hospitality and we're tempted to grumble, ah, oh, I'm busy that week. Listen, I think we can say from this passage, if we're too busy to show hospitality, we're busy doing the wrong things. If hospitality has become a competition, to impress ourselves or to impress others, we're focusing on the wrong thing. Hospitality isn't about honoring ourselves. It's about honoring the God who has shown hospitality to us, who welcomed us. We grumble because we forget the hospitality of God. We also grumble because we forget the cost of God's hospitality. Hospitality costs stuff. I mean, you've had people over, it costs stuff. I mean, have you ever had the experience, like it's a tight month and you're thinking, I'd like to have somebody over, but 
um, you know, where are we going to get the money for that this month? I mean, I don't. It costs you. It costs you time, doesn't it? It costs you time. It costs you a night. And if, if, if you're a, a, a good, pleasure-loving American like I am, you like nights off. And we tend to define joy as something that occurs in private without the annoyance of other people, don't we? But that's not how God defines joy because that's not how heaven's going to be. God defines rest as being in fellowship, not out of fellowship. Sometimes I think our view of rest is a little more private than God's is. God enjoys being with his people, but sometimes we don't. I think our hearts need to be reshaped. It could be that one reason we have forgotten is that we forget the cost of how much God was willing to pay to have us with him. Sometimes we would rather not have people with us even if we don't have to pay any cost. God desired us to be with him to such a degree, not because he needed us to, but he desired us to, to such a degree that he was willing to pay the cost of the death of Christ. That's the cost of God's hospitality. If you, if you turn over a page, it says in chapter 1 that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. <laughs> Notice how Peter throws out silver and gold as though they're worthless perishable things, silver and gold. I don't know how you feel about silver and gold. I tend to like silver and gold. High bank accounts, money in my budget, nice house, Walls without crayon on them. I, I, I like silver and gold and those kinds of things. I tend to like the things that hospitality takes from you. Peter treats them as nothing. This is worthless silver and gold. But I said hay and stubble, silver and gold, worthless. You weren't purchased with those kinds of things. Oh, no. Here's what you were purchased with. The precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. What was the cost of God's hospitality? The blood of Christ. He welcomes us to heaven knowing that the cost of our invitation is the death of the Son. That's the cost. That's the price tag in God saying, welcome into my home. That's the cost. That's the cost of my salvation. God says, welcome into my home. And the cost is my Son will die in your place. So I think when we grumble, it reveals something actually very helpful. It reveals we, we, we've been neglecting, we're not enjoying the incredible love displayed by the cost. I'm, I'm not meaning to, to discourage you. If you're tempted to grumble at hospitality, I'm not meaning to, to discourage you this morning. Here's what I'm wanting to do. Here's what I'm wanting to do. I, I'm wanting to say that grumbling is ultimately a reminder from the Lord that there is a feast of gazing at the hospitality of God that will do good for your soul, that will bring you joy and peace and incredible sense of God's love, and that the, when you feast at that table, you will turn with joy to see how you can display that. So if you're tempted to grumble, view it as a little email that says, you, you've been missing out on seeing how good the hospitality of God is. Consider the cost of your salvation. Consider how much God paid to bring you into heaven, to bring me into heaven. Silver and gold? No, the blood of Christ. And then, let's put silver and gold in perspective, shall we? Did that little four-year-old knock a hole in your wall? Did Mr. So-and-so come over again and talk for an hour straight with no interruptions? Barely keep your eyes open the whole time. Did Mrs. So-and-so come and talk endlessly about how difficult her life is? Couldn't get any of your chores done that day. The schedule was thrown off and you didn't get your alone time. What about the person who 
is constantly pointing out your faults. You heard that person? Walk into your house. Oh, why don't you just fix that? I like it broken. You know you can just pick those up easy at Home Depot, right? I do now. <laughs> Silver and gold. Reputation. A sense of being appreciated as much as you want to be, Peter would say. Irrelevant. You have a chance to love like God loved. You have a chance to welcome the way he welcomed you. You have a chance to shine like a star in a dark world filled with selfishness. You have a chance to bring heaven to earth. Don't grumble. Rejoice. Rejoice. Our hearts and our homes should be a refuge of love for the people of God. Let me encourage you to do what Peter does and make this tangible. Have a conversation with your family. What does it look like to make our home hospitable? And let me also encourage you, I think comparison is <laughs> a great snare to godly hospitality. The verse doesn't say, make sure other people show hospitality without grumbling. <laughs> you keep an eye on those other Christians, make sure they're showing hospitality. That's not the word Peter sent into the future. What should I say to them? Keep watch over one another that you show hospitality without grumbling. <laughs> no, you do it. You do it. You show hospitality. Yeah, but Lord, says Peter, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? You could almost imagine him saying, how many times shall I show hospitality and he not show it to me? As many as seven times, Lord? When does heaven get old, Peter? That's when you stop loving. When heaven gets old, you can stop loving. You can stop showing hospitality. Our hearts and our homes should be a refuge for the people of God. Charles Spurgeon says this, As soon as ever the heart is given to the master of the house, it is given to the children of the house. Love Christ, and you will soon love all that love him. Let us say to the king in this church, you are welcome in my home. Let us tell the crucified one, no cost is too great to give you and your children a roof over their heads, a meal, and an atmosphere of love to cover over their multitude of offenses. Let us say to the Lord and host of heaven, make my home available to your children. Let's make our homes a refuge for the people of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for inviting us to heaven. Mm -hmm. 
But I want to pray for anyone this morning that is experiencing distance from you again. Just come back to that same burden from our singing time. And maybe they've been thinking of salvation primarily in judicial terms. But I, I would pray that they would see in this passage your heart relationally. Lord, that you, you call us to yourself as children. You call us into your family. You called us to be permanent residences with you. Lord, I just pray you would speak your love into the hearts of those who feel cold, who feel distant. Lord, I, I pray that if there's anyone among us, and this is true of myself and all of us, Lord, where we, we feel the grip of grumbling, Lord, bring us to the cross. Bring us to the gospel. And Lord, let that cross melt, Lord, our hearts. Free us from the grip of grumbling, from reluctance, from an idol of privacy, Lord, from protecting ourselves. And Lord, cause us to abandon ourselves to you. That since we love you, Lord, we will love your children. And in them, we welcome you into our home. Cause us to be a mark of our church, Lord, now and into the future and long after we're all gone and enjoying your hospitality, Lord. May this church be known and marked by a welcome into the home kind of Christianity. Lord, we pray that you would do that among us, Lord, where we have schedule changes that need to be made because you give us grace we ask you for grace to change them, Lord, where we have budget changes that need to be made. Lord, give us grace to change them, where we, where we just need to initiate. Give us grace to do that. Lord, cause this to be true of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.